afternoon, my name is Andy Banta. I am the storage janitor at NetApp. I am the actual only storage janitor at NetApp. So uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about private clouds, how to build them, how to use them, whatever else you want to do with them. Ask questions along the way, all, however many of you are here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer them simply so this is, your, is, this is for you, not for me. Let's talk about, about what you need to actually build a private cloud. You're here at VMworld. I'm guessing you pretty much know about compute virtualization. Storage virtualization would be the next step, the idea that you can actually take some storage and divvy it up in a way that's meaningful to, to a bunch of different clients. And network virtualization, same idea there. To make it into a cloud, to make it serve up services like you do with uh, AWS or Azure, you need to have self-service automation. So you need it to have not have admins that are going to be uh, doing IT ticketing for you, uh, taking care of all the different things. You also need IT, uh, your IT department needs operational transparency into this since people are self-serving services and uh, utilities for themselves. You need some way to make sure that the IT department can actually see what's going on. On top of this, you actually need some way to make sure that uh, the customers that are using it are getting charged appropriately for it and they're not overusing resources, uh, not using more resources than they should. Let's jump into network virtualization. I'm pretty sure you understand ESXi and how compute virtualization works. I'll get into a little bit about how I element this storage virtualization, network virtualization. If you're using VMware, you're already doing a little bit of network virtualization with virtual switches. NSX takes this one step further, allows you to actually do software-defined routers and uh, be able to segment out your system so a bunch of different tenants can be sharing it all at once without interfering with each other, without causing damage to each other, without causing all sorts of other things. So basically, it, it separates it out in separate blast zones. In addition, it allows you to distribute this across your entire data center. NSX is a little bit of a pain to set up. So one of the things that we did at NetApp was actually build out a couple uh, Python scripts that allow you to do it a little bit better. So one will deploy an NSX manager. This one here is deploying our NSX controllers. Uh, it actually spells out what various different arguments you need to do this, making it a little bit easier so you don't actually need to go out and figure things out as you're doing it. Um, this is not something that's specific to NetApp. Anybody can use this. This works for any installation of NSX. It's intended to make things a little bit easier. On top of that, we, uh, we could lay on the vRealize suite. So we actually have talked about how we do this in detail in what we call a NetApp verified architecture. If you're interested in seeing how we built this entire system out in detail, just remember NVA1122, Google fans the rest for you, just nice and easily. Uh, similar to the NSX script I just showed you, the vRealize suite lifecycle manager allows you to fill in various different information to build out the vRealize suite. So we have vRealize Operations Manager, vRealize Automation, vRealize Orchestrator, vRealize Login Insight, vRealize uh, Cloud for Business. This is a way to go actually go in and fill in all the information you need to, to actually build out a, -real, a complete vRealize suite. You can pick and choose the components you want or need or have paid for. Um, you'll actually spend more time filling out this form than you will deploying vRealize suite itself. This form probably will take you a little bit over an hour to get all the fields filled in on it. Uh, you know, that's provided you have your network mapped out appropriately. And once you've actually filled out all the information, it's, it'll do a validation check, make sure that everything you filled out in the form is correct. Once the validation check is done, it actually only takes about 40 minutes to, to deploy all these various different components on the system. So here we can see there's 13 different steps it's going to take. I have no idea why VMware likes these wavy little lines to show progress. Makes no sense to me, but that's what they show off. So that's how you uh, can deploy vRealize Suite. Uh, vRealize Operations Manager is the IT component of the vRealize Suite. So the Operations Manager actually gives you a step beyond what you get from your vSphere web client. It actually goes down, shows relationships between objects, VMs, you know, connections uh, that very, through various different network connections for your storage, that type of thing. It'll show you where there's potential bot bottlenecks or components that are being overly used. It'll show you if there's risks, like some firewalls not being closed up appropriately. It'll show you where things might be inefficient, where you, uh, if you're not using things as well as you can. It does this through management packs for all of the various different components. So the vSphere and NSX management packs are available from VMware. Other management packs are available from 
the individual vendors for the individual components. So I'll show you one from NetApp HCI in a few minutes. The next component would be V-Realize real, realize Automation. So this is really the heart of the V-Realize suite. Uh, this is, gives you a role-based access to do a bunch of different things in a service catalog. The service catalogs are built up for the appropriate roles. So like for an end user, the service catalog might include deploying VMs, backing up VMs, restoring VMs. For an IT administrator, it might be creating a data store, laying out a new network, adding a new tenant to a system, all of those possibilities. So let's actually get into multi-tenancy here. Uh, one of the key things you actually want for private cloud is the ability to have lots of different tenants on it. You don't want each organization in your company having its own private cloud. That doesn't really make sense. That still means an awful lot of IT work to set, keep it all up and running. The whole idea with NetApp HCI is that you actually can have a single data center with a single private cloud that all the entire, the entire company can use, allowing all the different organizations to have access to it as they need. So one of the ways that we do this is we actually have a way to guarantee the number of IOPS to each one of the tenants, so you're not actually limiting, uh, you're not actually uh, storage throughput limited for the various different tenants. And since we can actually set this guaranteed QoS for each one of them, it means that they're not going to interfere with each other. You can have a lot of different tenants in the same system, and they all work together. In this case, we can actually see that we have a minimum IOPS of 15,000 for this tenant, and even as the workload increases, there's, uh, there's no drop in the IOPS. Uh, this, you, we do this at a volume level, so if you want, you can do, uh, do this setting for an entire VMFS data store. Alternatively, if you need more granular control, you can actually set it for each individual VM in your system using VVOLs. So this would actually allow you to set it for each individual virtual disk on each VM, not just the VM itself. This way you don't end up with a noisy neighbor type situation in your VMFS file system where one VM is consuming all the throughput available to that data store. So let's actually look at adding a tenant to a system. Here we actually have vSphere Web Client and we're showing off a, a system that has two tenants on it already, one named GlobalCan and one named Warehouse International. What we're going to do is go through the process of adding a new tenant. So we're going to jump into the vSphere Web Client for NetApp HCI and we're going to tell it we want to create a new storage container for VVOL's data store. We're going to call this tenant Acme, and we're going to just give them the compute resources that it needs. At this point, we can actually see that there's a couple, uh, Global Chem and Warehouse International have a few virtual volumes already. We can see those are out there in use. We don't have any for Acme yet. Next, we're actually going to go off and create some storage policies for Acme. So the only thing that we're going to create for storage for uh, Acme would be the, a database uh, VM. So let's go through and create some storage policy based management rules for this. Uh, the minimum number of IOPS for the OS disk 250 should do it. Let's go in and give a little bit more for the data disk. We'll set this to a minimum of 5,000 IOPS for the data disk uh, since your data disk is going to need more than the OS disk. And finally, let's go in and set a policy for the log disk of about 7,500 IOPS minimum simply because lots of times the log disk needs more IOPS than the data disk. We have these policies set up. Now we can jump into NSX and we'll go through the process of creating a couple uh, logical segments in NSX for this um, tenant. So we'll set up a segment for, say, some uh, DB servers and let's go and throw a segment in for app servers just for fun as well. So we can uh, show off a little bit more as well. Once you have these segments set up, you'll actually need to have an edge services gateway that these two distributed logical routers talk to to be able to get out to the outside world. Notice that you can actually say that you want to be highly available. Uh, you can set credentials for each one of these uh, um, setups so the individual administrators of that tenant can manage their own network. And the rest of this is going to turn into cartoon speed simply because there's lots and lots and lots of stuff to set up for NSX. You need to go through, set up IP addresses, VXLANs, the virtual port groups for the, uh, all the individual tenants. Uh, and here we'll actually go through the process of setting up a firewall for it. We're not actually going to show off the entire thing, just you can actually set up an individual firewall for each one of them. So let's jump into vRealize Operations Manager and take a look. This is the, the standard dashboard for vRealize Operations Manager and here we actually have a uh, NetApp HCI cluster overview. So this shows things like 
the CPU utilization, memory usage, IOPS, all the various different pieces for all the very dis various different things in the cluster. This would be a volume heat map, so this isn't really showing anything wrong with the volumes, it's simply showing that some of them are more heavily used than the others. Here we have a, a um, NetApp HCI cluster overview. We can see that there's a warning on one of the node clusters in the node, and we can go in and drill down and see exactly what that warning is right away. And finally, we can actually take a look at the virtual volumes map. And here we can see that we have one volume that seems to be heavily used. We can also see what storage system it's all on, which VM it's associated with, all the various different components there. So let's actually jump into vRealize Automation and show off how vRealize Automation works. We set up this tenant named Acme, so this would be a uh, skin vRealize Automation page that we made for Acme. And uh, we have this user named Doug who's going to go in and do some things. So uh, Doug seems to be a fairly boring person with nothing on his bulletin board and nothing in his calendar. But Doug has the ability to actually set up some uh, VMs. So. Uh, we'll go in and we'll uh, actually create a new um, database VM and, uh, you know, give it a description. And here we can actually go in and set the policies for each one of the, um, each one of the virtual disks on this system. So Doug will go through and, and do this. And uh, we'll go through it. We can actually see that this goes through and uh, um, has completed this operation that's underway. So what we're actually going to show is that Doug screwed up the uh, um, setup of one of his systems. So we come back to vRealize Operations Manager and actually see that there's uh, one VM, what that one vVol is misbehaving. We go sort on this. We can actually see that uh, the, that one VM is being heavily used, but the uh, IOPS and latency associated with it are very low. So if we uh, go log, drive in, drill into vRealize Log Insight, we can actually see some additional SCSI errors associated with it. And if we actually search on these SCSI errors, we can actually go find that, uh, come on, here we go, that we can actually find the VOBD deteriorated message in there saying, okay, the performance for this one virtual disk has deteriorated. We jump back over to our vSphere web client. We can actually go in and look at the VMs that were associated with it. And if we take a look at uh, each one of the VMs or here, we actually see the, the performance is low. We go in and take a look at the policies for each one of the VMs. We can see this one has three policies associated with it. Second one will have three policies associated with it. And then the third one will only have two policies associated with it. So let's actually drill into that a little bit better and see what's going on. Well, we misconfigured one of them to have the OS policy on, both, on two disks. So what we can do is actually change this immediately. To, to be the policy we wanted. And uh, when we say that, we, once we apply that, it gets changed automatically and we'll see that this is immediately compliant and that means that we've changed the IOPS for the underlying volume for that virtual volume immediately and uh, fix it up. And if we jump back into vRealize Log Insight, we can actually see that we'll get the improved message as well. So. This actually gives you a quick overview of what's available through vRealize Operations Manager and vRealize uh, um, Automation, and a little bit of what's available in vRealize Log Insight, and I would have been able to run through the end of the demo, but they're back there waving frantically. So thank you very much for being here.